Hey there, it's Jason Stein, host of Cars and Culture with Jason Stein on Sirius XM, as well as on this YouTube channel. We interview everybody, actors, athletes, musicians, business leaders. We talk to the people who lust for the vehicle and the people who make them. So like and subscribe. Let us know what you think right here on Cars and Culture. Hey, this is Brian Ray. This is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. He is a fixture on stage, part of the band that has been described as the best Paul McCartney band since the Beatles. <laughs> That's pretty heady stuff. And now into his 20th year uh, uh, with Paul. Brian, how are you? I'm great, Jason. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thanks for being on the program. You've had quite a summer and quite a tour. Let's just get into it with Paul. And I want to talk about, was it the 500th show together that you did as, as a band that just happened to be at Glastonbury? Yeah, it just happened to be at Glastonbury. How about that? Uh, 500th show together? In a way, <laughs> it's surprising. Like, it seems like it should be more after 20 years. But then you think of that number and just take it one at a time. It's a lot of shows. So, yeah, man, what what can I say? It's It's the ride of a lifetime. It's more than a job. It's a life-changing event you know and i'm just so so happy about it yeah so fortunate so many people talk about glastonbury as being sort of a pinnacle uh if you will in the sort of festival world what was it like for you well so we had played glastonbury once before back in 2004 i believe and that went very well and as it often does it rained during the show and you didn't <laughs> see one person hiding from the rain. Everyone celebrated the rain, because of course you're in the UK and you've got to celebrate it because guess what? You don't have a choice. Uh, and we had a, a terrific show back then. And so coming back 16 years later or whatever it is, it, it was quite, uh, quite something to be excited about and a little bit anxious about because, you know, mm -hmm. we're older now and we've done so much and we want to do great. And Paul is a guy who really cares about his shows, the quality of his shows. And uh, so you can always tell that Paul's anxious, you know, on a, on a show like a local show like that. Like I would be at a small club in my hometown of Los Angeles. He, he just he gets anxious. You wouldn't think so because he's Paul McCartney, but he really cares. So he does get anxious. So there's a lot of X factors just in the air and it's a festival. So you don't get a proper sound check. So there's less control than you would usually have, say, at a an arena once again, after two nights, after another arena, very similar. You don't have that kind of control. There's an X factor sonically, uh, visually, that's just new for you. All to say that you watched Paul McCartney. I watched Paul McCartney. 150,000 people watched Paul McCartney dig deep for the show of a lifetime. And Paul McCartney, who had struggled to be loved by the British press because they're the British press and they struggle to like anything, <laughs> it came out um, perhaps in, in a better position than he'd ever been in, in the press uh, over there. And I speak as somebody who's very far away, but that's my take on it. He was just lauded by everybody across the board and it was seen as a, a career defining uh show and yeah what can i say i've talked too much it was really really super not that he needs validation but uh, to some way that in some way that becomes validation right for all of those years and all those decades of being paul mccartney it does indeed it rubs out a record you know and a record that's undeserved in many ways in terms of the press's criticism. But again, you know what the British press is like. Sure. sure. Yeah, you probably do. Anyway, they're brutal over there and they yeah, don't they much of anything, you know. So uh, to get all of their love was, I think, very special for him. You could just feel it, you know. He called me a couple of days later. I was on vacation. He was going on vacation. He called me for his from his car with his lovely wife, Nancy, just to talk about the show and to say he missed me and thanked me. And we just had the nicest talk. And he was as surprised as anybody <laughs> you know, about, <laughs> about the show and how well it went. He said, yeah, God, I didn't know. It, 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 it felt great. 
you know, it's so <laughs> funny, you know. What's it been like for you? You know, let's go back to 20 years and the first time that you played with them. And it was a Super Bowl gig, right? And uh, the song was uh, was Freedom. Uh, well, that's in, correct, uh, yeah. In uh, well, New Orleans, was, right after 9-11. Yeah, 2002. Um, and I mean, it's a long story that I won't bore you with. Uh, but, uh, you know, I got an opportunity to play one song with him in 2002 as a... Uh, pre-show song before the national anthem with his newly formed, you know, band of renegades, this very band that you still see to this day, it was our first time together on a stage. And we did that one song freedom from his driving rain album. And it went well, I didn't know what to think of it. I was so excited and so beyond myself. I mean, I'm getting to meet and play with Paul McCartney. Are you kidding me? Um, it's a kind of, nervousness that you can't shake until it's just over you, there's nothing you can do about it i tried walking around the french port quarter for four hours to burn off some extra energy the the day uh that i was about to meet him you know it didn't help at all i was still anxious beside myself and i think that's generational you know if you're of an age as i am that you witness the beatles you know on television, live, uh, on uh, Ed Sullivan, you're going to have that kind of response. Anyway, after the show, you know, we're up watching the game, the Super Bowl, and uh, now it's the fourth quarter. Now it's the last five minutes. I'm going, well, holy shit. I mean, I don't know if I'm ever going to see him again. So sure. I'm going to go over to him now and thank him and just let him know what a, you know, pleasure this has been. So I do. I what we have a little box section and we're in there, our little seats and we're all enjoying the game. I get up, I walk uh, over and um, I put out my hand to shake his hand. And I just simply tell him that uh, it's been a, a real privilege and a joy to do this and what a, what a thrill it was. And thank you so much for having me. And then I realized I'm still shaking his hand. It's like, okay, maybe I should, <laughs> I should pull it back. <laughs> hand back at this moment. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we leave. Uh, we're all escorted out. I still don't know if I'm ever going to see him again. We all go back to the hotel and they say, hey, come up to the bar for a little drink. And I said, oh, great. I didn't know if he'd be there or what. Come up to the bar. And there's Paul on the piano playing Lady Madonna for anyone who will listen in the bar. Oh, well, everyone's listening. There's about 30, 40 people in this hotel bar. And then we sit down and we're gabbing away. And after about, you know, an hour of gabbing and camaraderie, he gets up with his wife and starts to say goodnight. And uh, he comes to me and he says, OK, well, Brian, good job. Welcome aboard. Stick with Abe and Rusty. They'll show you the ropes and we'll see you for fi in five weeks for rehearsal. We're going on tour. <laughs> and I turned to Abe and I said, did, did he just say what I think he said? Your world so stopped. This was my audition. You know, um, a little intimate venue, the Super Bowl. <laughs> and I still didn't really believe it because, you know, that was one song, you know. Anyway, we come to town and uh, five weeks later, I worked my ass off and here I am, 20 in my 21st year. Yeah. What a remarkable story, Brian. And it's not like you hadn't had a brush with greatness anyway. I mean, you played with Etta James, you met Phil Kaufman earlier <laughs> in your in your life, which <laughs> kind of got you started, but it's Paul McCartney. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, honestly, Jason, I felt like, you know, for me, I was fortunate enough to, like you say, get with Etta James at an early age, was introduced to her by the, the uh, notorious road mangler, Phil Kaufman, and uh, who was road mangling Etta James at the time, 1973. I was 18 and met her. You know, I thought, you know, um, by the time we had opened for the Stones in 77 and 78, a little bit of 79, no, 78, 79, a little bit of 80 Stone shows, I thought, well, that's it for me. I mean, that's as good as it gets. Jeez, I mean, what do I go from there? I was still getting really loaded and doing nutty things that you do in your 20s. And I got some of that squared away in my uh, mid, late 20s, early 30s. 
And then, you know, all these years later, Paul McCartney happens. It's just like, I, I don't even know what to say, man. It's like, I'm uh, as surprised as anybody would be, but yeah. <laughs> well, and you were around a host of other legends, including Carlos Santana. You've shared the stage with Joe Cocker, Bonnie Raitt, John Lee Hooker, Bo Diddley. Um, I mean, you've, you've been in and around this circle of, of um, Hall of Famers to some extent. How did the McCartney thing happen? Oh, that's another wild and long and lovely story. I had been working in France with, uh, you might know, Johnny Halliday and Mylène Farmers, two huge French artists that have come to Canada to play in, uh, uh, you know, French speaking at Toronto and Quebec areas. Um, but uh, there were big arena and stadium artists in France. And I was lucky enough to get that gig back in the mid 90s. Well, the person who got the drum chair on both of those gigs, one after the other, was none other than Abe Laboreal Jr. And uh, we became quick buds and roll forward a couple of years later, five years later, after a bunch of tours with each of those French artists together, uh, you know, Abe announced that he's going to stay in town next time to do uh, Katie Lang and to do some other stuff like that. And uh, another year goes by and he goes like, you're not going to believe this. I just got a call to play with Paul McCartney. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> I ran back to town and just said, let me just shake your hand. Anyway, he's at a birthday party of mine, 2002 and uh, January. And I said, well, are you going to go out on the road? He goes, yeah, I am. I go, wow, that's amazing. Well, who's going to play bass when he's playing guitar or piano and then play guitar when he's playing bass? And he goes, that's a good question, man. We're looking for a guitar player who plays bass. And I went, dang, dang, dang. I said, <laughs> well, I would love a shot at that. And it's that simple. Abe said, hey, that's a cool idea. I'll put your name forward. And then that was all of Abe's uh, involvement in that. He did put my name forward. And David Kahn the great producer of so many cool hits, including Sublime, you know, um, Bangles, uh, Paul McCartney. He uh, had a meeting with me, liked me. He then put my name forward to the next round. And I got a call the next day. Can you be on a plane to go to New Orleans to play with Paul McCartney in 2002? That was it, you know? Wow. Yeah. And when you're playing bass, and Paul McCartney is the one who's on piano or is on lead guitar. I mean, Paul McCartney plays bass. So he kind of, <laughs> he understands the instrument probably better than most people. Right. And, and it's rather intimidating. And it's um, a privilege, of course. And God, to be honest with you, nobody is uh, the right match for that except Paul McCartney. He's the guy who should be playing bass on every Paul McCartney song ever. But he wants to all play, also play guitar and piano. So somebody's got to do it. And I really relish a sort of, I don't know, the trust that he's given me at sort of an apprenticeship, you know, to play a bit of bass. And it's, it's lovely. I mean, those bass lines, he doesn't just play bass. He invented bass in popular music, in my mind, like in the same way that, uh, James Jamerson, uh, you know, redefined bass in rhythm and blues with Smokey and all the Motown acts. Well, Paul did the same and coincidentally loved James Jamerson in pop and rock and roll music. There's just no one better um, after him would be John Entwistle. But as far as reinventing, it's Paul McCartney, you know. Yeah. This program is cars and culture, and we're going to get to the car part of this uh, here in a minute. But culturally... Is there anyone who has who has had more impact culturally than Paul in his current in his current iteration and of course with the Beatles? I mean, that's culturally defining, isn't it, Brian? Uh, I that's a great, great proposition. I can't think of anybody who's had more influence and is more um, important, a, a lapidary career that's just I mean, his imprint is indelible on all of us in our lives in our brains, in our bloodstream, in our DNA. He is half of the writing team that defined uh, popular music, you know? Yeah, enough said, really. You have a favorite song you like to play when you're on tour with him? 
Oh, that's that's really hard to answer that one, man. It, it changes all the time. Uh, I'll be honest with you on bass. A real pleasure has been getting better from the Sgt. Pepper's album, because mm -hmm. if you listen to that recording carefully, you'll notice there's two basses on it. And one of them is a bit out of tune. And so it's got this really strange, you know, beating going on. One is more defined than the other, the other being a late night overdub, because the story goes that Paul would uh, come to the studio very late at night and work on arrangement stuff till three in the morning with Jeff Emmerich, often just the two of them. And uh, that's one of the songs that benefited from that late night scrutiny and that that sort of uh dogged uh sort of i don't know um pursuit of excellence that paul mccartney that defines him he's just like music is always going through that guy you you hang out with him and he's you can tell he's thinking of a melody you hear him whistling a song on the way to the drum set it's just like oh it's in him it's it's not like some kind of weird thing he just turns on and off. It's just always on. So that was one of those things where during that period, he was at the studio all night and he would come up with these things. Let me try this. And he would just keep doing it until he got something magical. In the case of let, uh, getting better, the bass part, if you listen carefully, changes. Every time the chorus comes up, it's a different bass part. It's not the same the first chorus as it is the second or the third. And the fun for me is to honor that and do the same thing, rather than to normalize it or regiment it. Why would I do that if he chose not to? You know, like I'm there to just sort of, I don't know, be a bit of a, you know, conduit and just put over his bass parts. That's, that's what I'm there. I'm not there to put over my bass ideas, it's his. He so is tireless on that's a fun one on guitar. Obviously, letting go is so fun for me because he he lets me shine a bit on that. Um, get back. Um, I mean, uh, I I love. There's just so much to love. What can I tell you? And a big event every night that we play together is um, maybe I'm amazed. I'm on bass on that one, but you know, do you really get to witness the power of his band of Abe? Rusty, Wicks, um, and uh, Paul, you know, at the top of his range and at the top of his emotional uh, abilities. It's just a sort of a flagship song. And I think live it is kind of a, it's a spotlight moment for the whole band and Paul. So that's a lovely one too. All of it. What can I say? And he's tireless uh, on stage. I mean, I saw him in Detroit uh, several years ago and you know, uh, I was amazed <laughs> that he he had the kind of stamina and energy and it just it was one rolling hit after another in a two hour, two hour, two and a half hour plus show. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I, th there are other artists who um, are far less accomplished, obviously, who also put in far less effort. <laughs> Boy, you're so right. And I think that that's. It just really says a lot about Paul McCartney and who he is as a man and his work ethic. You know, like he is a hard worker, okay? But I think that audiences might be a little bit shocked to watch Paul McCartney, who is, as you said, you know, unrivaled in, uh, you know, rock and roll, uh, as far as his contributions go. It's surprising to watch him work his ass off for you. That's <laughs> the shocking thing. Here he is at 80 years old, giving 80. you nearly three years, I mean, three hours of show because he thinks you deserve that and because he loves doing it. I mean, Jesus, it's crazy. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to sound like I'm promoting Paul McCartney. He doesn't need me to do that. It just astounds me and it's something to behold. Yeah, well said. Hopefully you're enjoying Carson Culture with Jason Stein. Like and subscribe to see more and enjoy the rest of this interview. That's culture. Now, cars. You are ah. a you. Are, <laughs> I see your eyes light up. You are a car guy to the core, and I want to talk about a couple of them. Let's start with the present, and then we'll we'll move backwards. 
you are about to buy a Lucid. Is that right? Yeah, I am. Why? What do you like about it? Oh, it's just a, uh, of all the EVs that are currently available, it has all the best features. It's the best looking. It's got the best performance. It has a far better fit and finish than anything available. The range is off the charts. The speed is there. The ride is crazy. It's silent inside. And, um, you know, it, it's got um, bi-directional uh, charging. So you could charge your home if your home is out and your car is charged. Uh, there's just so much going on with that car that is uh, next level. And I, I leased two Teslas and I'm so pleased to be able to do something new. And um, they they were really fun, fun leases, fun car. Um, I wasn't into the fit and finish at all. And the customer service left so much to be desired. So I'm buying into the guy who actually designed the Tesla S. That's right. Peter Rawlinson. Peter Rawlinson, yeah. So I, I'm I'm a big fan. I think it's great. And I know it's risky. I know it's a kind of a startup EV and it's a interloper. <laughs> you know, it's a challenger to uh, the EV space. But with its stats, with its range, like 500 mile range in real world. Yeah, give me one of those for sure. You grew up in Southern California. You're, you're an LA guy. You got to be a car guy to be an L, a, a Southern California guy, right? It's in our blood, but more than that, Jason, my, my father, my uncle, and my grandfather were all in a GM guys and, and they worked in the car, uh, car retail for a long time. And my dad at a Jack dealership. dealership before that at a dealership, Tom Ray Pontiac um, in Glendale, California. So as a young kid, I was around it all the time in that, that intoxicating smell of leather, vinyl, uh gasoline oil and uh it, it's just it's an intoxicating thing so as much as i want and use an ev to do the right thing for the planet and to go really fast uh i i'm also a nut for original 50s and 60s american automobiles a 1958 cadillac eldorado brome to be specific right do you still own that I still do. Yeah, that's that's kind of my collector collection baby. It's a, a labor of love. It's a very rare car. Uh, they only made 704 of them over two years. So the parts are exceedingly rare. It's a fussy, fussy car, but it is so graceful. And I don't know, it's charismatic. If a car could be charismatic, this car is charismatic. It came with six magnetized stainless steel shot glasses that you would put on a fold-out bar in the glove compartment, <laughs> a mirrored fold-out bar, you know, so it's, it's beyond. It's like Frank Sinatra owned two of them. So that'll give you an idea. Did your dad want you to go into the car business? Uh, my uncle did. My uncle said, when are you going to put down that banjo and come sell cars for me? <laughs> and you said no way i like the banjo in fact here let me also pick up this good this electric guitar too yeah the banjo i mean you know but anyway my brother did work for the dealership uh, my late brother steve ray uh and uh you know it was a hard hard work but i had already given my heart to rock and roll there was just no question as soon as i heard rock and roll as a two-year-old where I wanted to go. So that that was kind of uh, destiny for me. I knew what I wanted to do from a very but young age. Early memories were hanging out at the dealership? Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. You know, it was this shiny floors, cars in the window, cars in the, in the showroom, great big floor to ceiling windows all around. It's 1961, whatever. It's, you know, all these big Pontiac, wide track and Pontiacs are rolled out and they're so beautiful and shiny. I got a new like Grand Prix or GTO model every year from my dad. And I'd see all this sort of like older white dudes or it seemed older to me. I mean, I was five in the showroom selling cars. And then I would dip out the back door and in the alley, there were all these black dudes that did all of the prep work for the new cars. 
and were mechanics and um, assistants. And they were so lovely and kind to me. And, uh, you know, I don't know why, but I kind of gravitated towards the alley more than I did the showroom. Maybe that will tell you why I ended up in music rather than in a showroom, you know. So when you start working with Etta James and you're making some real money and you're, you know, touring with her, um, what do you buy as your first car? What, where did the money go? Well, hold on. Let me back you up there. I wasn't making real money with Etta James. <laughs> I was making... I literally told her I was a kid. I was 18. I said, well, I'll work for free. I just want to play music with you. You know, I mean, and she said, okay, <laughs> cool. And uh, there were times when I didn't get paid, but she did pay me uh, at, well for the time for 1974. And, um, you know, I was so fortunate to be there, but my, my first car was a 1968 MGB GT. Okay. First year of the GT. Uh, and I bought that from my stepfather who wanted to imprint a little bit of responsibility with money. And so he sold to me for $1,800 and I paid it off. And it was British racing green with a tan interior and I loved it. Perfect. And when you did start making real money and not doing gigs for free, what was the what was the kind of the pinnacle purchase at least early on where you said oh, now I can buy something that I really want? Okay, and it wasn't expensive at the time, but I got obsessed with uh, Studebaker Silverhawks, and uh, I didn't find one, uh, but I ended up with a 1960 T Bird convertible. No, oh, so beautiful. It was the Square Bird, you know that sort of catfish looking one? Uh, it was a continental white with a red leather interior and a white top and it was super fun i mean it's kind of big and it ain't fast you know uh but it sounded beautiful and it felt great to drive and i, I enjoyed the hell out of that for years so to say that um and you know here's a question for a musician it sounded good and now you're making this transition into evs which sound like nothing brian yeah so how does a car guy who has a, an MGB and a Thunderbird and a Cadillac Brome make that transition from internal combustion engine loud, the sounds are great, to the EV world? Yeah, sure. A uh, great question. Well, I, I don't make a transition. I, I drive the EV uh, to be, you know, a great day driver and be responsible because I go between the desert and LA all the time. That would be a lot of uh, fossil fuels used um, and a lot of pollution. I have solar panels on the, my getaway house and my um, LA house. So I charge my EV from, from the sun and that feels really good to me and really responsible. And then I come out to Palm Springs where I have some vintage American cars and I rumble down the road, uh, you know, for about five miles a week in one of these few uh, vintage cars and enjoy the hell out of them. And that's the way it feels good to me. I don't use a lot of gas, but I sure enjoy the smell and the sound of a good old American V8. So you're living with one foot in one world and one foot in the other and enjoying yeah. both. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah. What else do you have in your collection that you're fond of? The car wise? Uh, well, my until the Lucid arrives, I'm driving a 1988 Mercedes uh, 560 SL, which is a their last 560 um, uh, 107 model Pagoda roof. Uh, that's a V8 with big brakes and rear wheel drive. And that's a blast to drive. Real fun little sort of a luxury go-kart. Kind of. yeah. And then I have a... a I still have, a, as you said, the Cadillac Brome. That spends more time uh, sleeping in the shop than it does on the road, but I get it out there and enjoy the hell out of it. Um, I have a 68 Oldsmobile Toronado. That's uh, 67, sorry, second year. Uh, and that's a, the first American front-wheel drive car, big engine, fast, fun. Um um, I have a 65 Riviera GS, so that's the big engine, very quick, very fun, makes all the right sounds. And I just got something super exciting. I got a 1966 Pontiac Catalina 2 plus 2 with a 421 and a Hearst transmission manual force. Wow. 
a throwback to dad and uncle and grandfather. Exactly. So I finally, I never owned a Pontiac. Maybe it was part of oh. the rebellion. Like, okay, dad, I'm never going to get, you know, I'm going to keep now, playing that banjo. <laughs> I'm going to keep playing that banjo. No, I've got the banjo and the Pontiac. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. Cars are the foundation of music lyrically, you know, baby, baby drive my car. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Why are cars the centerpiece of of so much that happens musically? Oh, it started so long ago with the songs like, you know, Rocket 88, you know, with uh, everything Chuck Berry ever wrote. So it's always been at the foundation of lyrics and rock and roll. And obviously, car, drive my car. These are all metaphors and euphemism for so, um <laughs> It's just a way you could talk about without getting censored, you know. Good point. My, my Rocket 88, you know, drive my car. I mean, come on, man. You know, it's the cars even did that song. <laughs> you know, all of Chuck Berry's Cadillacs, you know, he was obsessed with Cadillacs. And it's all about, uh, you know, big cars that uh, that are fun to drive. Oh, I love it. It's so good. That's so good. You're a guitar guy too, a huge guitar guy. And in fact, uh, we have to go back to the 1960s in Southern California and you go down to the music store, you're 12 years old, you're on the number nine bus, paying a quarter for that bus ride. And you're thinking about guitars, right? <laughs> wow. You've, re- you've done your homework. I, I, uh, it's exactly what I used to do. So there was a, a string of uh, music shops and pawn shops in Santa Monica and I would go there every weekend, Saturday morning, right before opening time. I'd be down there by 10 a.m. I'd go eat some French fries and some drink of Coke at D's Coffee Shop. Then I'd start making my rounds. Uh, I would just go from one pawn shop to another, Ace, Pawn, and Loan, uh, to Bay City Music, to Cunningham Music, to another pawn shop, finishing the day at the flagship Santa Monica ace music up on santa monica at about 7th street and i cannot tell you how intoxicating that was for a kid um more intoxicating than the alley of tom ray pontiac and uh <laughs> i i just looked at these you know guitars from the florida ceiling on on three walls and a big window in front and amps all over the ground laid out real nice and I wasn't really much of a guitar player yet, but I wanted to be. And I just was fascinated with the guitars themselves and the older guys that would come in to play them. So I would just like be, you know, a fly on the wall all day long. And yeah, I bought my first vintage guitar there, which was an old Telecaster. Um, and uh, that got stolen in short order, unfortunately. But my second guitar I also bought there was a 1968 brand new Gibson Les Paul gold top. Mm. And uh, man, I love that guitar. And uh, yeah, that was my thing, man. Ace music on a Saturday with all the other ones thrown in. You still have the 1959 Les Paul standard as well? I sure do. Uh, Well, I have my first great Les Paul after that first vintage Les Paul I bought in 73. That's a 1957 gold top. Les Paul original uh, with humbuckings, of course. I still do have that. And that's the guitar I played uh, every show with Etta James on. Etta, right. Yeah, you said that guitar was road hard and put away wet. Oh, my God. Yeah, that thing looks like <laughs> it looks like Keith Richards' dad. It's just like <laughs> it is definitely road hard and put away wet. you got some new material out now. Let's talk a little bit about your uh, some of the new stuff that you've been working on. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, I've been super busy with a lot of stuff musically. And uh, I have a new single uh, that's released on Black Friday coming right up. Uh, And it's called um, On My Way to You. And on the B side is uh, the story of Bonnie and Clyde. And uh, yeah, the A side is is a real fun rocker romp. And I think it's going to be exciting. I'm I'm really into it. I've got a video for it, which has some really cool special effects in it. So you're going to want to tune into that one. Uh, Yeah, once again, on my way to you. 
and it'll be on Wicked Cool Records. It'll be released on colored vinyl oh. uh, as a single, 45. It'll be available everywhere you can purchase uh, vinyl, like at my website, brianray.com, or at Wicked Cool Records. Yeah, and I just got to give a shout out to little Steven Van Zant and to Dennis Mortensen and all the fine DJs over there at Sirius XM at the Underground Garage and Channel 21 for being such great advocates of um, artists uh, like myself and younger and older who, who have a home, who have a place to have their music played on the radio, on terrestrial radio, because he's affiliated all over the planet. He's in 180 countries on terrestrial radio, to say nothing wow. of all the serious satellite um, affiliates on terrestrial radio stations all over the world. So, you know, you actually see royalties from the airplay because it's terrestrial, not streaming. So, I mean, it's not about money. It's about, God, it's so... Um, satisfying to have a home musically and to have a project every every six months i put out a single and man they're they're so fun to work with how good was it to be back in the studio again for you i mean i know so much of this was shut down for a couple of years and of course touring being the obvious one but how, how good was it for you to get back in there and do some really cool things well because i have a, a home studio i never leave the studio it's always ready to just turn on and go work um so the pandemic uh, was was tough for so many, and we had so much loss and tragedy, and, and avoidable, unnecessary loss and tragedy, obviously. But you know, I did have time to get to work writing and playing music, and I was fairly creative uh, myself for that time. Um, a lot of it out here in Palm Springs, where I am right now. See the cacti. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and I'm you know, in your hometown, L.A. Right. Writing out here and then taking it home. I actually recorded a piano part on my iPhone on my upright piano. I don't have a studio out here. I don't even have a clock out here. It's a true getaway. <laughs> Ordered a piano line on my iPhone in the record app that ended up on my last single. Mm. Isn't that crazy? Wow. The, my, the miracles of technology, modern technology. Yeah. Crazy. Black anyway, Friday. Yeah. Home by Friday. Let's talk about a few other things. Um, favorite places to play, Brian. What comes well, to mind? Oh, man. Okay. So right off the bat, first thing that jumps to mind is I just did a fundraiser out here in Palm Springs for an 800 seat historic atmospheric theater that kind of depicts a Mexican courtyard as you walk in, like there's like balconies and windows and adobe, you know, roof and uh, a twilight, twinkling light, infinity ceiling, midnight sky and uh, 18, 800 seater. And we did a fundraiser to restore it. It was very successful. We had Alice Cooper, Paul Rogers from Bad Company and Free, uh, Josh Homme from Queens of the Stone Age and Orianti, hosted by Chris Carter of Sirius XM and KLOS fame, and uh, an all-star band, really, really fun band. That venue sounded so damn good, and it was so satisfying. We dialed it in. We were in there for three days with sound and light so we could really play with it. Mind you, sound and lights that don't exist in that building, all of it was brought in just for a one night event. And they all all donated their time as did I and the other artists. Um, and so that was my favorite venue in a very long time because it sounded, felt and looked amazing. To look out there at that little Mexican courtyard and those smiling faces, not anyone was sitting down at, at certain points during the show. That was a thrill. I've also loved huge places with Paul McCartney like uh, a football arena in uh, a stadium in Sao Paulo, where 60,000 people released white balloons all at the same time during uh, Let It Be. Wow. Oh, my God. You know, you events like this take your breath away. So it's that sort of contrast of, of scale and size, intimacy and largesse that, that kind of is thrilling. 
Yeah, we've had Guy Barron in, uh, on the program, of course, bass player for uh, Coldplay, who who said that, you know, for them and all of these super sized stadiums that they play, going back to some of the original small venues, I mean, those those small British pubs where they could play for, you know, 50 to 100 people has that kind of uh, intimate feel to it that, uh, you know, I would imagine you start off thinking, well, if I could fill an arena with 50,000 people, I'd be really happy. But ultimately it some may you know maybe even comes back right it comes back to the small the intimacy of it yeah i think that's true he's got a great point and paul always checks in with his roots and we always do a small venue and you just watch this master paul mccartney instantly transform into 16 year old paul mccartney at the cavern whenever we play a small place it's just in his blood he did so much of it they became what we discovered as the Beatles by doing hundreds of, of small shows. They did more shows than we have in 20 years as the Beatles to warm up in order to be the Beatles. You know what I mean? They were yeah. doing 300 shows a year for a couple of years. So they beat us by a long shot in terms yeah, of, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would love to know how many shows they played before at Sullivan. That, that would be a great Trivia question to find out. And I wonder if anyone knows. Right, right, exactly. When you go from Palm Springs to LA, what's on your playlist these days? Yeah, well, right now I, I have no playlist in my Mercedes. I just have an AFM radio and a CD <laughs> player that I can't find with a <laughs> CD on it that came from the previous owner. So I use that time to, to put my phone on um, hands-free and to do work, to do phone calls and you know, um, collaborations, to be honest with you. I'm I'm in a music-free drive zone. When I am in my car, it's always tuned to Sirius XM, Channel 21, The Underground Garage. That's just my jam. Listening to garage rock, old blues, uh, foundational rock and roll, that's my thing. Wonderful. When do you get the Lucid? When does it arrive? I, You know, in a matter of days now. It's oh, wonderful. Yeah, days but or now. weeks, not far off. Final thing, Brian, when you yeah. play these shows and and even let's go back to where we started, Glastonbury and the 500th show together as a band, 20 years, 21 years, 500 shows in the blink of an eye, you still look over at Paul and go, that's Paul McCartney. No doubt about it. Now more than ever, because, oh man, to be honest with you, taking in like you just ran it down 20 in my 21st year with him. So many shows, so many miles traveled. Yes, as you said, in a blink of an eye. But there he is. There is the man. And uh, it's just been the honor of a lifetime. And uh, to have his trust, to have a smile from him throughout the show, it's just like means the world to me. But to play those songs with that voice coming through the monitors, there's just nothing nothing that could ever come close but thank you so much for your time you. today man thank you brian what a pleasure thanks for being on cars and culture and sharing your story it's my pleasure man thank you bye-bye hopefully you enjoyed this interview on cars and culture with jason stein like and subscribe come back and see more interviews with actors athletes musicians business leaders it's all right here on cars and culture